Good morning again and welcome to Fairford Lees. I hope that last week when I was on holiday you were able to find a service, an act of worship from a different church or community from the great variety of things that are on offer at the moment. Next week there will be a service at this time on these normal YouTube and Facebook channels but it will be a slightly different service. We're part of the United Reformed Church area group in the Chilton area and next week all the churches in that group have contributed a small part to a service that we will be sharing amongst all those church communities. So back here at the normal time and place and you'll see a few new faces in that time of worship next Sunday at 10.30. But for this week, I wonder what is the most important question that you've ever been asked? Or perhaps one that you've thought to yourself. The sort of thing is maybe what kind of job or career would I like to pursue? Or what activities are really worth devoting my precious time to? Or maybe it's the romantic question that accompanies an engagement ring, will you? And then again on the wedding day, will you? But what about more abstract questions? What about questions about life? What's it all about? What are we doing here? And what about the question, who is Jesus? Perhaps that's the most important question of all. The famous writer C.S. Lewis said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if it's true, of infinite importance. The only thing it can't be is moderately important. It's a question that we should all consider and come to a definite conclusion about. Who do you say that Jesus is? That's the question which faced one of the disciples and his answer was so important that it led to the church as we have it today. Peter proclaimed Jesus as the Messiah and so we do the same as we sing together now the hymn All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
the talents. So we'll look at a Bible story, a craft, a prayer, and then finish with a final thought. So grab your drink and a biscuit and let's do this. When you're stuck at home with time to spare, can't go outside, you're not going anywhere. Why don't you pull up a chair or pull up a stool to an intervention Sunday school? We're the craft to do and a story or two. Say hello to Nat, she's stuck at home too. Why not tune in to virtual Sunday school? The parable of the talents can be found in Matthew chapter 25 verses 14 to 30. There once was a man who was about to go on a journey. But before he left, he called his servants and he entrusted them with his property. To the first servant, he gave five talents. To the second servant, he gave two talents. And to the third servant, he gave one talent, each according to their ability. Now, a talent was like money. In fact, it was like a lot of money. For a labourer, one talent was like 20 years of wages. When the man had left, the servant who had received five talents immediately started trading. All sorts of profitable enterprises. And through investments and trading, he managed to make five more talents. The servant who had been given two talents decided to do things a little bit differently, so he set up his own business. Through his hard work, he managed to double his money and make two more talents. But the servant who had received one talent wasn't sure what to do, so he dug a hole in the ground and buried his talent. After a long time, the master returned to see how his servant had done. So, the servant who had received five talents came forward with five more talents. And the servant who had received two talents came forward with two more talents. The master said, Well done, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful over a little, so I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The servant who had received one talent came forward and said, Master, glad to see you back. Hope you had a nice trip. Now I know you are a shrewd businessman and I didn't want to make you mad or lose your money. So I hid your talent in the ground and here it is, safe and sound. His master replied, You wicked and lazy servant, have you not done anything? The least you could have done is put it in the bank and then I would have received some interest. Then the master took the one talent away from him and gave it to the servant who had ten talents. To everyone who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But to him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. When it comes to money and worldly possessions, everything we have ultimately comes from God. In this parable, we can see that Jesus tells us to make the most of what God has given us. We shouldn't just sit on it or put it in the ground. We should put it to work and we shouldn't be lazy. Now, although the talents in this story refers to money, I think this story isn't just about money. I think it can apply to our actual talents as well, our giftings and abilities. Each one of us is given different gifts but we can all make sure that we use them for God and don't waste them, whatever they might be. Now, a lot of you virtual Sunday schoolers probably don't have to worry about money and what to do with it. But today, why not think about what other gifts God has given you and how you might use them for God? Craft time! We're going to create a poster to remember to use our gifts and not to waste them. Now here's a challenge for this craft. How about we do some recycling as well? So let's use things that otherwise would have been going in the bin to remind us to not waste things. Now I'll let you off with some paper, pens and glue because you probably weren't going to throw those away. 
but otherwise you have to use things that you would have been getting rid of. I've got some bits and bobs here and I'm going to cut out some letters from some newspapers to create my poster. But you can be as creative as you want. Rummage through the bins and go wild. Wait, Dad. why do you always try to eat it? Once you've finished, why not pop it up in your room and send us a photo. But before you go diving into the bins, make sure you ask your grown-up first because things might need a wash or there might be pointy things in there. For today's prayers, we are going to thank God for the gifts that he has given us. Dear God, thank you for the many different gifts that you have given to each one of us. Please help us to use these gifts for your glory and to not be lazy or waste them. In Jesus' name, Amen. And so, a final thought. Just like the master gave each of his servants talents, God gives each one of us all sorts of different gifts. We need to ensure that we use those gifts and don't waste them. And when you do use your gifts, don't be surprised if God gives you more to keep on using for him. See you next week. Why not tune in to Virtual Sunday School? The reading is from Isaiah chapter 51 verses 1 to 6, Everlasting Salvation for Zion. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Listen to me, my people, hear me, my nation. Instruction will go out from me. My justice will become a light to the nations. My righteousness draws near speedily. My salvation is on the way, and my arm will be bring justice to the nations. The islands will look to me and wait in hope for my arm. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. 
This is the word of the Lord. Remember how Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, went out among the people to give them new life and new hope, to heal the sick, to raise the dead to new life, and to preach good news to the poor. And his disciples, his friends and helpers, went with him to share his life and his work. And everywhere that they went, the people talked about Jesus and about what he had said and done and the things that they had seen. And Jesus asked his disciples, Who do the people say that I am? And his disciples said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, come again, to baptize people with water for new life and repentance. And some say 
that you are a prophet, a person who tells the people God's plan for them, that maybe you are the great prophet Elijah or Jeremiah come again. And Jesus said, But who do you say that I am? And Peter said, You are my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Peter, You are the rock on which I will build my church. Because you have said this, because you have understood, because God has shown you this, you will be the rock that my church is built on, a strong foundation, a safe place, not like sand that can fall away, but strong rock that will stay and be safe and well built. And I will give you the keys to heaven. And Jesus' friends heard what he said, and what Peter had said, and what the people were saying, and they wondered about it. I wonder which of these pictures, the water and shell, the book of the prophet's words, the rock, or the key, I wonder which of those you like the best. I wonder which of those pictures is most important to you and why. I wonder what the disciples felt when they heard Peter say, that Jesus was Lord and God. I wonder how Peter knew to say that. I wonder which part of this story is for you or about you. I wonder what Jesus meant when he said Peter was going to be the rock on which the church was built. I wonder who you think Jesus is and what's important about him. I wonder if Jesus was going to describe you with a picture, like he described Peter as the rock, what picture might he use for you? I wonder if there's anything in your house that you would like to use to make something or play with this story. And we can keep wondering throughout the week, but for now, our story is finished. <laughs> if you can remember as far back as 1969, it was quite a significant year. I remember it as the time of the Apollo 11 moon landing, but there was another major event that took place that year. An Act of Parliament was passed which would lower the age for voting from 21 to 18. And on the 1st of January 1970, 18 became the officially recognised age at which you became an adult. Before that, 21 was considered an appropriate age to start an independent life, to move out of your 
parental home and make your own way in the world. And as a symbol of that, as a mark of trust and responsibility, you would be presented with your own key to the house. No longer would you be a dependent child, but now an adult on an equal footing with your parents. And so from that, we have the symbolic idea of the key to the door. It was also seen as a key to the future, opening up all the possibilities which awaited you as a young adult. But with that came responsibility. Having a house key meant that you were trusted not to lose it or to abuse the privilege. And keys have often been seen in that way. A large symbolic wrought iron key still features in some inauguration ceremonies. They are entirely impractical, but they convey the weight of authority which goes with the position. So when Jesus says he is giving Peter the keys, this is not about the front door to heaven or the way into any particular church building. This is about authority and responsibility and actually about coming of age. In Matthew's Gospel so far, the identity and the authority of Jesus have been hinted at. It's been observed through personal encounters, through healing and through miraculous events. The evidence has been available. It's been there for everyone to see. Now it's time for the question to be asked, well, what do you make of it all? And it's asked in a very direct and pointed way to those who are closest to Jesus. He begins in a more general way. What's the gossip, he says? What are people saying about me? And then he gets that spread of possible answers. Well, John or Elijah or Jeremiah or maybe someone else. Reporting what you've picked up is quite easy. But then comes the crunch. But what do you say? What is your opinion? What do you make of all that you've experienced? Is Peter the only one who's brave enough to answer? Or is he the spokesman for the group? I think it's a bit of both. Peter is the one who's full of enthusiasm, but he says what the others are thinking. His role is representative. He verbalises the key fact that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Son of God. Matthew in the Gospel has alluded to this right from the start in the back room at Bethlehem. Now it's finally acknowledged and accepted and out in the open. This is where the disciples come of age. They're given the keys. And again, Peter is playing a representative role. He is to be the foundation of the church, not its entirety. And in fact, it's not even about him, because the foundation of the church is his confession of faith. In that pivotal moment, Jesus transfers his authority to the church. That doesn't mean that from then on the church can decide its own rules. It's more like the authority of a judge or a magistrate. They are there to enact the law, not to create new laws. Their authority rests in legal precedent and statute, and so it is with the church. Jesus is handing on his mission and all the responsibility that goes with that. Like the 21 or 18 year olds, we are now equal adults in the household. We're given freedom, but also responsibility. In these times of not being together as a physical community, 
it can be easy to lose sight of that. Without our regular activities and contacts, we need to remind ourselves that Jesus' mission hasn't changed. We're just carrying it out in new ways. We need to be just as alert to international issues, just as observant of the needs of our neighbours, just as passionate about justice and social change, and just as concerned for the spiritual welfare of our family and friends. We are the church. We have the keys, the authority and the means to bring about real change in people's lives. But that's based on the foundation, which has always been there, that we serve the Christ, the Son of the living God. And perhaps this time of being away from others has also given us a chance to think more deeply about that question for ourselves. Not to give the reports of others, not a second-hand experience based on being in a crowd, but a simple, direct question from Jesus addressed to each one of us. Who do you say that I am? listening to Pause, Pray from Engage Worship. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. How can you join in praying with Psalm 130 today? Who do you need to call out to God for? Is it something you've seen on the news? Something involving your friends or family? Or something personal to you? 
call out to God from the depths of your soul. sins. Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. Take a moment to consider if there's anything you need to say sorry to God for. Speak it out to him in your heart and receive his forgiveness. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Be still and wait in God's presence. God, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem you of all your sins. Lord, fill us up so we overflow. 